Somebody say amen. Amen. That's what I'm talking about because we're talking about the cross today. I don't know about you, but the cross excites me because see, the cross reminds me every time I see it that there was a price paid for me. Like, like really for me. The good thing is there's some people that know me and they know my heart and they're back there going, amen, right? Amen, if Jesus could die on two crosses, say amen for Robert, you know. But here's the truth of the matter. Jesus loved you and I so much that he paid this price that we can't even understand, we can't fathom because he loved us. Because God created us in his image and he wanted to reconcile us to him. This didn't take him by surprise. It didn't take him, uh, you know, that, oh no, I've got to figure out how to handle their sin. It was planned from the beginning because there was perfection that happened there. I got a call saying, hey, would you preach on the perfection of the cross? An email. And I thought, the perfection of the cross, this is going to be the greatest, shortest sermon ever. You ready? Here it is. Jesus was perfect. Y'all have a great day. You know, I mean, what else, right? Because you guys know that, ladies, you know that, that Jesus was perfect. You know what happened and how it all went down and everything like that. But God began to speak and began to talk to me about this idea of perfection. You know, our culture is inundated with perfection, right? Right? We've got to have the perfect this. We've got to have the perfect this. I can't eat carbs, y'all, because I'm striving for the perfect body, right? Good luck with that, preacher, right? I mean, we're striving for the perfect house. We want the perfect car. We want the perfect job. We want the perfect church. Watch out now. We want to preach the perfect sermon. tell you a story now first of all let me just say something just an aside I'm talking to a small group back here uh, crossroads folks thank you for coming today I love you so much do not tell this story at church okay just kidding you can tell this story at church y'all looked at me funny here's the thing I had the perfect sermon plan, Stuart. It was, I mean, it was going to happen. It was going to, it was, it was going down. And, and, and we had the, 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 uh, the action point where you can come down. I don't know if y'all have heard of this, but who's your one? Anybody? Yeah, good stuff. And so we've been going through who's your one. And the Lord gave me this idea, get a pallet board and we're going to have the pallet. You ready for this? Of prayer. I mean, the pallet of prayer is coming down. So we're going to do the pallet. You're going to get, there's no, there's no cards right there and Sharpie markers. And during the invitation, that was our invitation for the day. Today, you're going to get to come and you're going to write your one on the pallet. So I'd preach my heart out. We were talking the gospel of Jesus, the need for the Lord in our culture. I came down front to do the invitation. All oh, the people came. Like they came and they wrote their name on the card and they, they stuck their card on the wall. And I'm, I'm sitting really seriously on the front row thinking, this was it. This was it. The perfect sermon. Y'all, I got up right in front to close the service. Talking the challenge about go reach your one this week. And I turned around and I kid you not, I saw right there in the middle of that board, as, as, as clear as can be, Robert Mullins. Yeah, thank you. Somebody's praying for their pastor to get saved today. Yeah. I was like, hey, this is awesome. So if you want to do that, go ahead and pray that, okay? My name was right on that board as big as you please. And I thought I had the perfect sermon. I thought it was all figured out. Everybody's going to do it. Well, they're praying for me to get saved. That's awesome. That's wonderful. You know, right when we think we've got perfection handled, we're reminded that we don't even come close. You know, in the Bible, there's lots of stories about this. There's one in particular, and today we're going to kind of jump around in God's Word. Y'all got your Bibles ready? We're going to be in in, in Mark a couple of places, and we're going to be in Colossians uh, Colossians 1, 15 through 20, go ahead and look that one up. But we're going to 
I want to just kind of remind you of this, this other story. In Mark chapter 10, verse 17, there was somebody who thought that they'd figured this perfection thing out. It goes like this. As he was setting out on a journey, that would be Jesus, a man ran up to him, knelt down before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, you ready? I have kept all of these things. I've been perfect. I've kept all these things from my youth. Looking at him, Jesus loved him and said to him, but you lack one thing. Go and sell all you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But he was dismayed by this demand and he went away grieving because he had many possessions. To me, that story may be one of the saddest stories in scripture that he went away grieving. He met Jesus face to face and went away grieving because he couldn't repent and he couldn't believe and he couldn't follow Jesus Christ. There's no such thing uh, as perfect on this world beyond Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. The perfection of Jesus Christ goes beyond anything that we can imagine and it literally is because Jesus is king. The only perfect thing is Jesus and Jesus alone. In Colossians 1, 15 through 20, and this is our text, to look at the perfection on the cross. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, or by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds expressed in your evil actions. But now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. Amen? If indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, this gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and I, Paul, have become a servant of it. Let's pray together. Oh, Heavenly Father, you are the light of the world. You created all things, and in you, all things have been created, and we trust you, oh Jesus. Holy Spirit, be with us now. Let us hear you. Let us die to self, and let us Run with passion towards you and follow you with our lives. Lord, speak to us now through your word. In Jesus' holy and precious name, and all of God's people said, amen. In verse 15, we start off and we see that Jesus is the perfection on the cross. It's right there. It's all these things that he mentions. The perfection kind of plays itself out like this. We get to see that Jesus Christ, first of all, he is the perfect image. It says in verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. All these great people have, have tried to understand and unpack what this means, the firstborn over all creation. What does that mean? Certainly he's not a created creature. He was part of the Trinity and all these things. Ambrose said it like this. This is not the first in order of nature, but in order of eternity. I love that. And then Athanasius said, in him the creation came to be. Now I can grab that real easy because in other places it says that Jesus is the creator, doesn't it? John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things were created through Him, and apart 
from him, not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. Then it goes on to say this, and you know this, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. When you see Jesus, you see the Father. When you see Jesus, you see the Father. We feel the Holy Spirit in us now. The Trinity plays itself together. And the the thing about the way it all works is when we see Jesus, this perfection on the cross, this perfect image, flawless, blameless, we see God. We see God. Jesus was the perfect image. He also was the perfect creator in verse 16. For everything was created by him in heaven on earth. The visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Think about that for just a minute. We've forgotten this, haven't we? We think it's just about how smart we are. We think it's about how technologically savvy we are. You and I have seen the the Facebook posts that come out that are telling us it won't be long till they put a chip inside me. Right? I got news for you. I don't know how that's all going to play out. But I can tell you what's inside me is not a chip and it's not electronic. It's the Holy Spirit inside of me. Because Jesus Christ paid a price I can't pay on that perfect, perfect cross. And the Holy Spirit allows us to live and to walk in him every single day. I love to trick our folks at church. I asked this question during vacation Bible school. It was a great time, by the way. Where does Jesus live? Where does Jesus live? The first answer is what? In your heart, right? Well, that's the trick question. Really, Jesus lives where? On the right hand of the Father, right? And the Holy Spirit's the one that indwells us right now. Jesus is, is in our heart through the Holy Spirit. And so we get to act and walk. It says this, that we get to live and walk in the spirit. In my journal, uh, I try to journal every day and I wanna highly encourage you to do that. It's a time the Bible talks about writing things down and you can hear from God and I wanna encourage you to do it. Here's the thing, I wrestled with this. How do you live and how do you walk in the spirit and what's the difference in the two? And the thing is this, understanding that Jesus created me, I am, you are, we all are a spiritual being. When's the last time you had a really good talk with a lost person? Like you really just sat down. Like your goal wasn't necessarily, uh, are you ready for this? To convert them. Your goal was to befriend, have a conversation, learn about, listen. And you heard them talk and you heard them share. And what you heard was time after time after time. They've tried to fill that hole with something else that the perfect creator created a space for Holy Spirit in us. Not only is he the perfect image, the perfect creator. In verse 17, he is before all things and by him all things hold together. You ready for this one? He's the perfect glue. Actually, in Elmore County, where I live, he'd be the perfect duct tape, right? He holds all things together. So there's nothing worse than bad duct tape, right? Like you open it up and half of it sticks to the duct tape. But where I live, in my house, there's nothing better than a really good duct tape. Because when you get a high-end duct tape, It does exactly what it's supposed to do forever, right? This glue, you can get you some some super glue and get it all over your fingers. It's going to take a while, right? You might even have to get something else to get it off. It says this, and I joke about it, but it's not a joke. Jesus holds all things together. You ever feel like your family is falling apart? Be honest. You ever feel like, wait. Your church is falling apart? Or feel like everything around you is falling apart? I'm not good enough. I'm not a great enough pastor. I'm not a good enough husband. I'm not a good enough wife. I'm just not good enough. And you feel, if you're honest, 
I just can't do this anymore. I've had conversations with people in this room that have told me they feel like it's all falling apart around them. And I wanna tell you with everything I have, there's gonna be times where it feels like it's all falling apart, but he holds everything together. Jesus Christ holds all things together. Don't lose hope, press on. He's the perfect head. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. He's the perfect head. I'm not gonna get too much into this, but I don't know if you know this, the body doesn't work well without a head. Right? I mean, this is a pretty easy one for me to understand. So if the body needs the head, we need Jesus. If he's the perfect head, which is what God's word says, and I trust it and believe it, and guess what? I know it. There have been times where I've sought counsel from friends and, and others and, and even pastors and teachers, and that thing that I was hearing from the perfect head was resonated all through their help and encouragement, and it was because God said it. He is the perfect head. He's also the perfect vessel for God to dwell for God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him, in verse 19. I mean, think about that. Anybody have children out there? I have two boys. And the older they get, the closer I think I feel to them. And we become even friends at some point, and, and we're doing life together. And for me to know that one day I'll pass on everything I have to them. You know, God the Father chose to do that when he sent his son. The moment he sent his son, he gave him the fullness of God. Do, do, y'all, do y'all really think this now? I know how church can be. It can be tough. You can feel the darts coming for you. It can be a lonely place. And you're sitting there and you get to that point, we call it Eeyore at my house. Oh, woe is me. Remember Eeyore? Eeyore? It's going to be a rainy day, right? And we start doing this in our life, and we start internalizing this for a moment. Don't do this. Jesus Christ was the perfect vessel for God, and guess what? We get to be the perfect vessel for his Holy Spirit. Again, I don't understand how all that works, and sometimes I don't feel worthy for it, but I know this is an image issue. If you see yourself as the dirty, rotten sinner you are, you need to look at the cross. You need to remember that Galatians 2.20 says, it's no longer I that live. I'm crucified with Christ. In verse 20, the first part of that, it says that Jesus is the perfect reconciler. Through him to reconcile everything to himself. Terrence, what a great message. You talked about reconciliation this way and this way. And it's all about that. Look, if we're just doing good things for folks, if we're just having block parties in the neighborhood and giving them, you know, shave ice and and a bouncy house, that's called humanitarian effort. What they need is Jesus. Now, and, 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 and this is serious to me, because if you are out there doing something just to manipulate someone to Jesus, I believe that's sin. We know the saying, you can't take them somewhere you're not going yourself. You can't give them something you don't have yourself. And you and I need to make sure that we are walking with Jesus, that Jesus has reconciled us to the Lord so that we can reconcile others to him. Jesus is the perfect reconciler, everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And then finally in this passage about how Jesus was perfect, He's the perfect sacrifice by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. He is the perfect unblemished lamb that paid a price for you and for me that we could not pay at all. We couldn't pay it if we wanted to. We couldn't pay it it if we tried to. Um, we, We all know the song, Jesus paid it all, right? I love that song. Y'all sing it with me. Jesus paid it all, all to him I all to him I owe, right? Let me ask you the question. Now, now, forgive me a little bit. Is that true? 
Is it true? You would say, yes, it's, of course it's true. He paid a price for me, so I owe him everything. If I take you to lunch, I say, Dana, hey, lunch is on me. Am I going to have my wife or secretary or somebody call Dana and say, hey, where's that 20 bucks at? That seems silly, doesn't it? He doesn't owe me anything. Lunch is on me. But guess what? Something happens that's dynamo, that's dynamic. Our friendship grows as we do this thing and as the price has been paid. I don't know how it works, but I do know this. Yes, of course, I owe him everything that I could say, especially in our language that's limited. But the truth is, Jesus is much more concerned about whether or not, or, or not concerned about whether I owe him. He's concerned about whether I love him. He's concerned about whether I want to obey him and do what he says. A joy in my heart. My life has been changed. It's not that I have to, it's because I, I get to, I want to. I can't help it. Jesus is the perfection in the cross. As I was praying through this and the short sermon idea kind of went away, God said, you know, it's not so much about the perfection of the cross in this room. Because everyone in this room should know about the perfection of the cross. But in this room, it's about what is your response to the perfection on the cross? What is my response to the perfection on the cross? What are we going to do about it? What is it going to look like? Well, you know what? This passage of scripture keeps going. In verse 21, it says, Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds, expressed in your evil actions. Here's what happens in our response. There's a point in time, just like the rich young ruler, that Jesus says a few things to us. And through Paul's words to, to Colossians right here, it says this. Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds, expressed in your evil actions. Our sin makes it necessary to repent. Our sin makes it necessary to repent. Each one of us have sin in our life and we have to repent. Our evil actions make it necessary to repent. I also want to remind you that repentance is an interesting thing. This is what Jesus calls time and time and time and time again. He says to repent and believe, right? In Mark chapter 1, you know this. After John was arrested and so uh, in, in uh, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God, the time has come. The kingdom of God has, has drawn near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus says it over and over and over. And we talk about, I talked about the rich young ruler well, just a minute ago. You know what I believe Jesus told him? The same thing. Well, preacher, I don't understand that. He said, go sell in all you have, give it to the poor, and then follow me. Well, here's what he said. This word repent is a big word. Um, follow this. Repent, when Jesus in Mark 1 was going up to the fishermen, was he calling them away from sin necessarily? I mean, we know they had sin in their life, right? But he was calling them, this is, the time has come, the, the kairos moment is in your life. And it's time to repent. And we know it goes on, they drop their nets. That word repent's a big word, metanoia is the Greek word. And metanoia means simply inward change. You know, if I talk to you and say, what does the word repent mean? You tell me to turn away from some sin that you're doing and, and go another direction. That one would be Jesus Christ. That is true. However, the word repent is bigger than that. There's going to be, you ready preacher? There's going to be some good things you're doing you need to repent of. There's going to be some good things you are doing that you need to repent of so that instead of just good things you're doing, you're doing God things. Those guys were just fishing. They were just doing their job. They were doing a good thing. But he called them to repent. And then he called them to believe. So he calls them the inward change and the word believe. So sin makes it necessary to repent. After we repent, we must believe. Verse 22, 
Now he has reconciled you by his body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. So if Jesus is calling those men on the boat, the disciples, to repent and believe, metanoia, the inward change, the word believe is big, big, big right here. It's pisteo. This is an action word. It is an outward change. So if he's calling us to repent, it's an inward change. Paseo, believe, is an outward change. Please help me when we're preaching this. This is so important for the sake of the gospel. I say help me because, man, I just want to see people get this, don't you? I mean, don't you want to see the light bulb turn on? Because this is the way that I, I've heard it preached. It was preached to me. I've heard this before. If you just believe... Meaning, and what we've meant with it is, if you just think. But that's not what the word pisteo means. It means there is action tied to your belief. Always. Well, back to the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler looks at Jesus, and what's he say? He says, I've kept all these things since my youth. Jesus looked at him, loved him. I kind of think Jesus kind of had pity on him right there. I think that, that's that love thing. You've kept everything. Yeah, right. Jesus loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Now follow this. Go sell all you have and give to the poor. Okay. Jesus said to repent. And believe. Repent is an inward change. Inward change has to do a lot of times, most of the times, with idolatry. It's what we're serving. It's what we love. It's what our life is about. Repent from that. What was the rich young ruler's idol? Money and possessions. Jesus addressed the repentance issue he said, repent, go sell in all you have. Then what did he do right after that? He said, believe. He said, go give what you make away to the poor. Repent and believe. And Jesus does this, what he always does. He says, and follow me. Directly to the rich young ruler, just like he did. Just like he did to the disciples. We've got to follow Jesus Christ. We must remain steadfast and follow Jesus Christ. In verse 23 of Colossians, if indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you've heard, if indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you've heard, we have to stay grounded steadfast. Steadfast is to follow Jesus Christ. We have to stay in step with him forever and ever and ever. So this call to repent, believe, and follow is cyclical. We keep doing that in our life. We keep following him. When there's times to repent, we repent. When there's always time to believe, we do it. We let our actions show it. It's interesting to me when Paul is talking to him here, he emphasizes this in Colossians 2, 6 through 8. He says, so then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, being rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught and overflowing with gratitude. Continue to live in him. That's a press on word. That's a follow me word. Continue, keep going. You're rooted you're grounded, built up, you're established. You're growing like you're supposed to grow. You're living like you're supposed to grow. And y'all, don't forget, it's the perfection of the cross that allowed us to do these things, that allowed us to have this passion to follow Christ. We're rooted, built up, established. And following Jesus, just like he told the disciples, just like he told the rich young ruler, just like he tells us, repent, believe, and follow, we must be a disciple that makes disciples. 
Remember the perfect conversation we were having at the very beginning? Talked about all the perfect things we're going to do. We're going to be the perfect this, that, and the other. I've talked to a lot of pastors, a lot of preachers that say the number one way they disciple people is in their preaching. And I'm sure that some of you, every Sunday, you write the perfect sermon. I don't even remember what I preached two weeks ago. You know, like don't corner me on that, really, because I, well, I'm writing for next week or the next week and I'm doing the series and I'm thinking, what did I preach three weeks ago? You disciple people by discipling people. I hope that you are preaching God's word. I hope you are trying to break the the word down so that we can all understand and comprehend. And that is an incredible form of you discipling people, Pastor. But like Paul, we're supposed to be a disciple that makes disciples. I've been studying Acts lately. And I've been watching Paul in his life. And one of the things that I see a lot of is being in people's homes. And it doesn't feel like when I'm reading in the book of Acts, it doesn't feel like a checkoff, by the way. You know what I'm talking about. Like somebody's name's on the board because you hadn't seen them in a while or they're sick or they're homebound. I've got to go see them and then check it off and you're good. It seems like a relational issue that this pastor, this disciple maker, this missionary wants to do life with people to the point of even staying days with folks. There's a phrase we use at our church and I want to encourage you. We borrowed it from somebody. Doing life together. We're not a perfect church. We're not a perfect place. I'm not a perfect pastor. But I do serve a perfect Jesus. And he's called us to do life together. And he's called me to make disciples that make disciples. To take the time to to encourage and equip the body of Christ. To encourage you today to do this. If you haven't had people in your home. I've even met pastors that say, oh no, we can't have people in our home. They would learn way too much about us. Well, praise God. (laughs) You know. We were at a point in time where we were hurting. Me and my wife were hurting. And there just life, just some stuff that kind of happened. And the church was aware of it. And um, my wife kind of got in on this little project. But I didn't. They forgot to tell me about it. And I'm sitting on the couch and it's beyond time that we would normally eat. And I say, hey, do you want me to just go out? to grab something and bring it back. And she said, oh, no, we're good, we're good. We'll, we'll do it later. I'm, I'm kind of into this movie right now. And, and a few minutes later, the back door just opens up and people start yelling, hey, we love you, Pastor. Hey, we love you. And they brought this incredible Italian smorgasbord over to the house to say one thing, we love you. We want to do life with you. And the thing is this. As we look at the perfection of the cross, all are welcome. All need to hear. But all need an investment. All need your time, your energy, and your effort. Let me tell you this. And there's guys, I'm looking around this room right now, they can testify That when you begin making disciples intentionally, there's nobody that gets the blessing bigger than you. So, we know the gospel. The kingdom of God, he created it all. Christ, the perfection, die, death, burial and resurrection, repent and believe, But y'all, I think sometimes in our gospel that we teach, we've cut out something that Jesus never cut out, and that was to follow him. We wonder why we have people come in and get saved and join the church and do the church thing and then disappear. 
True or false? Let me see your hands. They come and they do, and, 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 and here may be the reason. Maybe the reason is because somebody's not connecting with them right here to do life with them and teach them how to follow Jesus. We cannot separate discipleship from conversion. They're all part of the same. And I want to encourage you today, as you see someone saved, either have a direct pipeline for someone ready to disciple them or disciple them yourself. Because here's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid in most of our churches, when the rich young ruler comes down the aisle, that we say something like this. Well, just pray this prayer, be saved, baptized, and join our church. The Lord will do the rest. While all the while, the perfection on the cross is at the right hand of the Father. And he tells us to repent, believe, and follow. Let's pray together. Dear Father God, today, for some of us, is a time of repentance. For some of us, is a time to just scream hallelujah. You've paid a price that we can't. We want to live for you. But today, maybe another time of repentance that we get to say, God, I've left the follow part out in my life and I'm not teaching others. Today, show me how to do that even more and more each day in lieu of the perfection of your cross. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen.